time to every purpose under heaven. To everything turn, turn, turn. There is a season turn. Okay, so good afternoon. So some of you who don't have gray hair or no hair uh, may not know who Pete Seeger was, but Pete Seeger was a genuine American hero, world hero. Uh, not, not a hero who uh, fought battles or was a violent man, but a very peaceful man whose life and reading about his life is something you would greatly enjoy, and I'm sure over the next several days there'll be an enormous amount written about his life uh, uh, in the newspapers and magazines. Uh, to most people, he was known as a folk singer, but he is responsible for the whole wave of like around the 1970s when suddenly it seemed like every thoughtful college student was playing a guitar and was singing songs that had some real substance and meaning to the words. And he started that whole revolution, which coincided with the anti-war movement at the end of the Vietnam War. But that's only a small chapter in his life. At any rate, uh, he peacefully went to sleep yesterday at the age of 94. And one of the songs we were playing when you came in is one that uh, uh, he wrote, of which he wrote many, many, many ones. So he was a hero uh, to many people. And uh, I can't say he was a friend. I met him a couple of times. But he, he was really an inspiring uh, person to people of all generations. OK. So in thinking about today's uh, session, which is really state of the art, uh, this is not only a whole new area of uh, kind of medical, increasing medical awareness, but it's an area that beautifully illustrates this union of basic uh, biological cell-based science uh, and uh, human disease. Well, we've had many examples of that. What makes this unique? Well, I, I think this is unique because this deals with a different level than anything that we have heard before. So let me explain that. In thinking about it, this is what I came up with. <laughs> Uh, sort of in the 18th and in the 19th century, the big movement was pathology and try and relate it to clinical events. There was nothing objective. There were no blood tests you could speak of or anything. So it was all based really on pathology, on organs. And then by the next century, we begin to see the increasing influence of biochemistry, uh, then later, cell biology, and then sort of the explosive wave of molecular biology and genomics. And the whole thing then begins to shift into a more cellular focus. But behind it all, each time, is the notion that uh, we're going to explain complicated human diseases because of these new discoveries. Uh, Genomics is going to elucidate the basic mechanism of everything from cancer to development. And from one perspective, you might say that it will. But you might think about questions like, you know, if somebody smokes two packs of cigarettes a day for 20 years, why do only 30% of them develop lung cancer? I mean, what are the things that make the differences between all of these things that we focus on in a very reductionist way and almost like Mendelian, one to one to one. So what I'm getting at is that today's uh, presentation is something that bridges into what it seems to me is the most exciting new uh, frontier uh, in both cellular and molecular biology, 
And that's regulatory phenomena. What regulates what goes on? And we're increasingly aware of uh, microRNAs, uh, of post-transcriptional modifications, and all of that sort of stuff. But in cell biology, the notion that there are regulating proteins that profoundly influence how different other proteins come together and do their thing is a whole new dimension that's only just opening up. So today's topic of the adapter proteins is an example of that. And boy, we're very, very fortunate because the two speakers today uh, have individually and collectively uh, really made major, major contributions in this. So the first speaker is going to be Juan uh, Bonaficino. Uh, Juan received his PhD uh, in Argentina. Oh. <laughs> uh, and then it came to the NIH in 1981, uh, has remained here, uh, became the branch chief of the cell biology and metabolism program, and is really known throughout the world for his work on adapter, adapter proteins and many other areas of cell biology. So one is going to speak first. And then he'll be followed by Craig Blackstone, uh, who got his MD and PhD degree at Johns Hopkins and then trained in Boston in neurology and uh, uh, internal medicine. Uh, came here, and he is the uh, director of the neurogenics branch, neurogenetics branch of NINDS. Now, independently, and then in a remarkable way, collectively, these two gentlemen have put their expertise together uh, to cross that bridge that we usually show that goes across the East River in New York. So we're going to hear an extraordinary example of bridging very much at the frontiers of where things are at. So, Dr. Bonaficino. Can you hear me well in the back? OK. Well, good afternoon. And thank you very much for uh, braving the cold uh, to be here to talk about uh, these uh, adapter diseases, or more generally, as I change my title, the uh, genotic, genetic disorders of protein codes, of which adapters are one of the uh, components. I want to thank uh, Wynn for inviting uh, Craig and, and me to participate in this uh, new edition of the Demystifying uh, Medicine um, uh, cor uh, course. Um, he uh, first uh, approached me uh, a few months ago to ask me if I could uh, participate in this course. And that was a very uh, timely uh, question, timely request, because shortly thereafter, uh, these three scientists, uh, Jim Rothman, Randy Sheckman, and Tom Sudoff, were awarded the uh, 2013 uh, Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine because of their work on the molecular mechanisms of vesicular transport, which involve precisely protein coats uh, that are involved in vesicle formation. So I think uh, having uh, these, uh, these two talks today is, um, is a way to celebrate the achievements of these, of these three scientists. So in the, uh, in the part that I am going to present, I'm going to cover uh, four uh, topics. First of all, I'm going to introduce protein coats involved in protein trafficking. Uh, then I'm going to uh, very briefly uh, touch on the uh, diseases that are caused by mutations in protein codes. And this will be a very quick overview of the many diseases that are now known to be caused by mutations in code proteins. And I will not be able to delve very much into any one of them, except for two of them, which are defects in the AP3 adapter complex in a form of hermansky putlak syndrome, which was the first uh, disease caused by mutation in a protein code to be described here at the NIH. 
And then I'm going to discuss more uh, recent work um, uh, describing uh, mutations in subunits of the AP1 complex, a different type of adapter uh, protein complex in a couple of neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, so on to the uh, introduction of protein codes. Uh, so um, protein codes are involved in protein trafficking in what we call the endomembrane system of eukaryotic cells. Uh, that includes uh, various membrane-bound compartments, uh, such as the endoplasmic reticulum. And I, I shouldn't stand, uh, well, I'm a little bit confused between the two <laughs> screens here. Uh, the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, the uh, cisternae of the Golgi complex, the uh, trans-Golgi network, different types of endosomes, including sorting endosomes, late endosomes, various uh, recycling endosomal compartments, lysosomes, and a family of organelles that are known as lysosome-related organelles, or LROs, uh, which are hybrid organelles that function to store some cell type-specific um, uh, molecules, as well as have some properties of lysosomes. And those include melanosomes, platelet-dense bodies, cytotoxic T cell granules, and, and other uh, cell type specific organelles. All of these organelles uh, participate in various uh, trafficking pathways. For instance, the secretory pathway that starts in the endoplasmic reticulum and ends with the release of substances into the extracellular milieu or uh, at the plasma membrane for transmembrane proteins. Uh, the endocytic pathway that starts in the extracellular space or the plasma membrane, and then goes through um, uh, sorting endosomes all the way to lysosomes, or uh, some molecules recycle through uh, recycling endosomes back to the plasma membrane or the extracellular space. Now, all of these organelles that uh, are part of the endomembrane system are interconnected by vesicular transport pathways. So the way that uh, cargo molecules, as we call them, go from one compartment to the next is by packaging into a transport carrier, most often a vesicle and very often a coated vesicle, sometimes tubules. Um, okay, so um, the studies by the uh, three winners of the uh, two, two, uh, 2013 Nobel Prize and, and of many other scientists in this field have led to the uh, development of this paradigm for uh, vesicular transport between organelles of the endomembrane system. So everything starts in a donor compartment, which could be the ER or it could be the plasma membrane, uh, where a um, vesicle, a coated vesicle, is formed by recruitment of um, uh, coat proteins from the cytosol onto a membrane uh, the, uh, to lead to the formation of a protein coat. These are called protein codes because they were first visualized by electron microscopy as an electron-dense deposition of some uh, proteinaceous material on a membrane, uh, on uh, vesicles or, or other uh, membranes, and that's why they are called uh, protein codes. In most cases, all the codes that I am going to talk about were, have been observed to form these kind of structures on uh, vesicles on membrane. In a few cases, they still have not been visualized, but because of their structure and function, they are expected to function in a similar manner. So the function of the coat is twofold. Uh, first of all, they contribute to the formation of a vesicle, to the budding of a vesicle from the donor compartment. So they sculpt the membrane to form a vesicle. And the other important function is that they select certain cargo proteins, both transmembrane proteins and soluble proteins, for packaging into those vesicles. Uh, now, at some point along this itinerary of a transport vesicle, the coat is lost. It dissociates from the membrane. It goes back into the cytosol, and it's to be reutilized in the formation of other uh, coated vesicles. And then the uncoated vesicles translocate uh, in the cytosol 
by interactions with cytoskeletal elements. They could be microtubules, they could be actin filaments, until they are captured by tethering factors that are associated with the acceptor compartment. And once they are captured in the vicinity of the, uh, of the acceptor compartment, vesicle snare proteins, uh, which are fusion proteins that are uh, included among the cargos of these transport vesicles, pair with target snare complexes, which are found in the acceptor compartment, and, and to form complexes that then sort of zipper up, leading to the fusion of the uh, membranes of the transport vesicle and the acceptor compartment. And this manner, the, uh, uh, both the transmembrane and the soluble cargos are delivered into the acceptor compartment. So this is the paradigm of vesicular transport that applies to many stages of the endomembrane system. Okay, so the question, uh, okay, the question is where is the specificity? The specificity of transport between uh, different compartments uh, is conferred by the use of different protein codes at different locations within the, the endomembrane system. And now I'm going to summarize three types of protein codes that have been described today. Uh, one of them uh, is the one that I refer to as clathrin adapter protein-like codes, which are the most diverse and the most numerous and which are very well characterized in some cases. Uh, so these codes consist of an inner layer uh, that that's close to the membrane that's composed of several adapter proteins. So these are the adapters uh, in, in the title of, uh, of today's uh, talk. And uh, some of them are multi-subunit complexes, while others are monomeric proteins. And they are called adapters because they bind to the tails of the cargo proteins that are going to be packaged into the transfer vesicles and, uh, and they also bind to an outer scaffold layer, which in the case of clathrin codes is composed of clathrin triskelia. So they adapt the tails of the cargo proteins of the transmembrane cargos to the scaffold of the code, which is what you can see by electron microscopy. Uh, okay, in addition to these uh, clathrin AP light codes, there is a second type of code uh, which is the COP2 code, which was discovered by Randy Sheckman. And uh, this code also has an inner layer uh, in which there is a small G protein, SAR1, that recruits two other proteins, SEC23 and SEC24, which function as the adapters, and uh, to select cargos for inclusion into the COP2 coded vesicles. And then there is an outer layer the scaffold of these codes, which is composed by two other proteins uh, named SEC13 and SEC31. And finally, um, there is a third type of sorting device, uh, which probably functions as a code, but still has not vi been visualized as such by electron microscopy, although I think it's a matter of time before somebody uh, images the, uh, these, uh, this complex on a membrane. This is the uh, retromer complex, uh, which doesn't have a well-defined uh, inner and outer layer, but that's probably because we don't really understand the structure of this code very well, and which is composed of three uh, proteins, VPS 26, 29, 35, and two sorting nexins, 1, 2, or 5, 6, which are recruited to membranes by virtue of interactions with a small uh, GTPase RAP7. So there are some common themes in all of these codes. There is always a small GTPase that recruits an inner layer and which in turn recruits an outer layer. And, and so this complete ensemble of proteins is what mediates vesicle formation and cargo sorting. Um, okay, so uh, the uh, clathrin AP type of codes are the most numerous and most diverse. And I will not have time to go into any detail about the different properties of these codes. But I would like to point out a few things. Uh, so um, there are different uh, codes containing as adapters 
uh, these multi subunit complexes named AP1, AP2, AP3, AP4, AP5, the COP1 complex is also structurally related to these, and there are also some monomeric adapters. Um, all of these uh, adapters are heterotetramers. In the case of AP1, the subunits are known as gamma and beta 1 adapting, and there is also mu 1 and sigma 1. And the subunits of the other complexes are all homologous. They are all structurally related and function in a similar manner to select cargo for uh, packaging into transport vesicles. Some of these adapters uh, use clathrin as the uh, scaffold of the coat, and others use different proteins like SPG11, and you're going to hear more about that from uh, Craig uh, later. And uh, they bind to membranes by interaction with specific membrane lipids or with small uh, GTPases. They bind different types of sorting signals in the tails of the transmembrane cargos. For instance, AP1 binds uh, motifs that have a critical tyrosine residue or other motifs that have critical leucine residues, which are known as tyrosine signals and dilucine signals. Uh, they have different localizations and different functions depending on where they are located and the cargos that they recognize. So I would simply like to summarize now the locations of these uh, complexes uh, of these different codes, which give clues as to what their function uh, is. First of all, COP2 is found on ER exit sites, and it mediates export of newly synthesized proteins from the endoplasmic reticulum. COP1 is found uh, on the ER Golgi intermediate compartment or the cis Golgi complex, and it mediates the reverse uh, transport process retrieval of proteins from the cis Golgi back to the endoplasmic reticulum. And again, by the way, this was discovered by Randy Sheckman, COP2, and COP1 was discovered by uh, uh, Jim Rothman. <coughs> um, okay, so uh, then AP1 has been ascribed multiple functions, and the thinking about what AP1 actually does is still evolving. Uh, it has been uh, shown to mediate bidirectional transport between the trans-Golgi network and, and sorting endosomes. Uh, but lately, uh, a lot of evidence has been obtained for a role of the AP1 complex in uh, sorting of proteins from the trans-Golgi network or recycling endosomes to specific domains of the plasma membrane in uh, polarized cells, such as epithelial cells and neurons. And there is very good evidence now for roles of AP1 in sorting to the basolateral surface of epithelial cells and the somatodendritic domain of neurons. AP2 is the main endocytic adapter. It's the one responsible for the endocytosis of the transferrin receptor, for instance. Uh, the AP3 complex mediates transport from tubular endosomes to lysosome-related organelles such as melanosomes and platelet-dense bodies. Um, AP4 is also associated with the TGN, and there is evidence that it mediates transport from the TGN uh, to endosomes, uh, but there is also evidence for the role of AP4 in polarized sorting of some receptors to the somatodendritic domain of neurons. Uh, AP5 has been uh, shown to be associated with late endosomes, but its function is not known. It's, it's the most recently described among all of these complexes, and there have been essentially one or two papers on this complex. So we still don't know very well what it does at the cellular or molecular level, but Craig is going to tell you how important it is um, in the pathogenesis of some um, uh, movement disorders. And uh, finally, the retromer complex uh, mediates retrograde transport from endosomes back to the trans-Golgi network. And it, I represented it differently because uh, this complex does not lead to the formation of a vesicular transport carrier, but it leads to the formation of tubules that transport cargo between uh, endosomes and the trans-Golgi network. So as you can see, this is all very complex, and, uh, and we are still in the process of understanding what a number of these uh, complexes uh, do and how they function 
uh, to sort cargos, and in many cases, what the relevant cargos are. And, uh, but uh, for this, actually, it has been very uh, useful uh, to find that there are genetic diseases that are due to mutations in some of these codes. So the study of these genetic disorders uh, has uh, been very informative in terms of what the functions of these codes that were first defined biochemically or because of their localization is. And this is what I'm going to tell you about next. Now, uh, mutation, as you might imagine, mutations in uh, subunits or components of these protein codes will result in missorting of the cargo proteins that are normally sorted by these codes. And sometimes that has uh, very serious consequences on cell or organismal physiology. Um, and among these codes, there are some that when you mutate a subunit that occurs as a single uh, subunit, that's lethal and very often embryonic lethal in mammals. So some of these are really essential components of the, uh, of the protein trafficking machinery. And for example, the AP1 code or the AP2 code, when you mutate one of the um, subunits that occurs as a single uh, form, uh, then that's embryonic lethal. Uh, whereas others, like AP4 or AP5, when you uh, mutate uh, the genes encoding those subunits, uh, the, uh, the animals are viable but they exhibit some, uh, some uh, pretty severe phenotypes. And uh, this is important in order to understand the pathophysiology of some of the diseases that we are going to talk about. Because when you find mutations in components of these codes, it will either be mutation in, the, in a gene encoding an isoform of a subunit of a code that occurs as multiple isoforms that have partially redundant uh, functions, or it will be a point mutation that results in a hypomorphic uh, phenotype, or it will be a mutation, uh, a complete null mutation, but in one of the codes that are not essential for viability, but which are essential for uh, a number of physiological functions. So that's just in the, to present an overview of what I am going to show you next. So now I'm going to take you through a very quick tour of diseases, and, uh, and unfortunately, as I said before, I will not be able to get into much detail into most of them, although after uh, the talk, if you want, uh, uh, we can discuss uh, about some of these specific diseases. So let's start by uh, COP2. Uh, so COP2 uh, is involved in uh, export from the endoplasmic reticulum, so you would expect that mutations in subunits of this complex would result in, uh, in retention of these proteins in the endoplasmic reticulum and impaired secretion of these proteins into the extracellular space. And this is what was found. There are mutations in at least three components of COP2 that have been shown to cause a genetic disease. Uh, one of them is mutation in an isoform of SEC23, one of the components of the inner layer of the uh, COP2 code, which causes uh, what's known as cranial lenticular satural dysplasia. It's an autosomal recessive disorder of bone development of the skull, and the uh, patients also have a skeletal dysplasia. It's a mild skeletal dysplasia, which is probably due to impaired secretion of procollagen. And uh, so it's not a complete inhibition of the secretion of procollagen, but uh, it's a partial inhibition, suggesting that this particular isoform participates in the secretion of procollagen from the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, then there are also mutations in SEC23B, another isoform of the same subunit of this, co uh, of this code. That causes a completely different disease, uh, which is known as congenital dyserythropoietic anemia, type 2, uh, which is a defect in the development of red blood cells. And uh, the, this, the cellular, cellular cause is really not very well understood, but what's been uh, found is that uh, the, um, the glycoproteins on the surface of red blood cells are much less processed, suggesting that there is a defect in the export of 
some carbohydrate modifying enzymes from the endoplasmic reticulum, although this hasn't been uh, formally demonstrated. And finally, there are mutations in SAR1b, which is an isoform of the GTPase that recruits COP2 to membranes. And this causes uh, what's known as Anderson disease or chylomicron retention disease, which is a failure to um, secrete chylomicrons in uh, the intestinal epithelial uh, layer, uh, resulting in the fat malabsorption and also a malabsorption in, uh, in fat-soluble vitamins. Okay, so these are the COP2 uh, diseases. Um, now, the only one of these codes for which a disease has not yet been described is COP1, so we are going to skip that one. Although I wouldn't be surprised if at some point and, uh, uh, a disease will be found and that uh, implicates one of the subunits of this complex. Then AP1. Um, so there are a couple of uh, neurodevelopmental disorders that are caused by mutations in isoforms of the sigma-1 subunit of AP1, which are known as the Mednick syndrome and the Fried or Perigrew syndrome. And I'm going to go into more detail later uh, in my talk about uh, these diseases and how AP1 might be involved. Um, okay, then we uh, move on to AP2. Uh, AP2 is the main endocytic adapter, um, and, uh, and we knew already from work that we had done in, in mice that it's essential for, uh, for viability. So I was a little bit surprised when patients were found that had a mutation in one of the subunits of AP2, the sigma-2 subunit, and that causes a disease that, has, that is known as hypocalceric hypercalcemia. So this is elevated levels of calcium uh, in, in the blood. And um, what's interesting about this mutation is that it's, it's a point mutation. It's arginine 15. And that residue is involved in the recognition of dilucine signals. So it's a partially impaired uh, uh, recognition of dilucine signals that leads to this disease. And with respect to the pathogenesis, uh, it's interesting that there is a a cal calcium sensing G protein coupled receptor that is expressed in the parathyroid gland and in the kidney uh, that senses calcium for regulation of calcium levels uh, in the bloodstream and for uh, excretion into the urine. And uh, so the mutation in AP2 suggests that internalization of that receptor, down regulation, is required for this receptor to be able to sense calcium levels. And when there is a mutation in, in this uh, subunit or in the receptor, there is increased parathyroid hormone secretion, and that leads to mobilization of calcium from the bone, excretion of phosphate, and elevated levels of calcium. So it's an interesting pathogenic mechanism but still not very well understood and that I'm sure will be um, studied in much more detail. There are a couple of other proteins that cooperate with AP2 in endocytosis, and I would like to mention them briefly. One of them is ARH, which is a monomeric uh, clathrin adapter involved in endocytosis of the LDL receptor. And uh, so mutations in this uh, adapter cause hypercholesterolemia because of an inability of the LDL receptor to be internalized and to remove LDL particles from the bloodstream. And finally, dynamin-2 is a protein that uh, pinches off the uh, clathrin-coated vesicles from the plasma membrane. And mutations in dynamin-2 have been identified in several uh, diseases, which may all be related. They may all be manifestations of the same problem, including forms of charcomary tooth disease or centronuclear myopathy or lethal congenital contracture syndrome. They are all pretty much manifestations of the same uh, genetic disorder. By the way, if you would like to interrupt me, I'll be happy to uh, entertain questions during the talk and not after the talk. Um, so feel free to interrupt me. OK, so um, then comes AP3, uh, which is a complex that uh, we studied in our, in our lab. 
and, and uh, it's involved in transport to lysosome-related organelles uh, such as um, melanosomes. And we found many years ago in collaboration with Bill Gall that mutations in one of the subunits of AP3, a subunit isoform, beta-3A, are the cause of a pigmentation and bleeding disorder known as the hermansky pudlak syndrome type 2. And I will be talking uh, in more detail later in the talk about this disease. Uh, AP4. So uh, am I losing you with so many of these uh, complexes and diseases? Uh, we'll get into more detail about a couple of these. Um, so then AP4, which is one of the more recently uh, discovered uh, complexes, um, and which are involved in transport from the TGN to endosomes or to domains of the plasma membrane. So mutations in each of the four subunits of AP4 have been shown to cause a very similar uh, disorder, uh, which is a form of hereditary spastic paraplegia. It's a movement disorder, uh, but which presents with mental retardation. So it's, it's a complicated form of spastic paraplegia that also presents with mental retardation. And Craig will be talking about this uh, disease. Um, AP5 was, the discovery of AP5 was published about a year ago uh, or so. So not much is known about this complex. And uh, it's associated with late endosomes. But interestingly, uh, mutations in subunits of AP5 in particular, the uh, Zeta subunit of AP5, have been shown to also cause a form of uh, spastic paraplegia with mental retardation. So, and w I was discussing with uh, Craig how similar this was to the AP4 mutations. And there are similarities, and there are differences that Craig may uh, explain or not during his talk. Now, interestingly, uh, the AP5 complex is like the other AP complexes. It has five subunits. But it doesn't use clathrin as a scaffold. It uses a different protein that is known as SPG11, uh, which is a clathrin-like uh, protein. And mutations in SPG11 have been known for a long time to be a cause of uh, spastic paraplegia uh, with mental retardation. And finally, to end this very uh, quick uh, walk through the adapters and, and the uh, diseases related to the adapters, uh, there is a retromer complex, which is involved in uh, retrograde transport from endosomes to the Trans-Golgi network. And uh, I think a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, uh, mutations in one of the subunits of retromer, VPS35, <coughs> were shown to be the cause of an autosomal dominant uh, adult onset form of Parkinson's disease, uh, number 17. And uh, so mutations in VPS35 in Parkinson's disease patients have now been found in many populations uh, around the world. Uh, now, interestingly, there are uh, other proteins that are mutated in other forms of Parkinson's disease for which there is some evidence that they cooperate with uh, retromer in mediating retrograde transfer from, um, uh, from uh, sorting endosomes back to the trans network. So anyway, the summary of all this, and, and this, you know, it, it doesn't cease to amaze me that uh, all of these protein codes that were first identified um, biochemically or, or uh, because of their similarities, uh, homology, localization within cells, because of their ability to recognize certain signals that mutations in virtually all of these complexes have now been identified as causes of some uh, genetic disorder. So now I would like to tell you in a little bit more detail about two of these complexes, AP3 and AP1. Any questions so far? We can talk later. OK. So AP3. So AP3, mutations in AP3, in one of the subunits of AP3 so far, are the cause of a disease known as hermansky pudlak syndrome, which was named after the two Czech physicians who 
described it in the, in the 1950s. Uh, so the hermansky pudlak syndrome is an autosomal recessive uh, disorder that is rare in the general uh, population, but is much more common in certain genetically isolated uh, populations, such as the island of Puerto Rico, for instance, where this is the uh, most common single gene uh, genetic disorder. Um, so it's characterized by oculocutaneous albinism. So there is a pigmentation defect in the eyes and the skin. That's what's most uh, visible. And, uh, and the defect uh, ranges from very severe albinism to uh, a pigmentation defect that is not so easy to recognize, but is there. But in, in all of these patients, what you see is when you do iris transillumination, if you shine a light through the iris, uh, in a normal individual, it would be dark, like here. But in these patients, you see that there are vast areas of the iris that lack pigmentation. And if you look at the retina by performing a fundus, in a normal individual, this would be the color of the retina. In these patients, you see these uh, areas here, these clear areas uh, that represent areas that have no pigment. And because of these problems, these patients have very poor vision, blurry uh, vision, and, and many of them are considered legally blind. Um, okay, so uh, now this pigmentation defect in the skin and the eyes uh, is due to abnormal melanosomes, which is this type of uh, lysosome-related organelles that I mentioned in, uh, in, in that scheme. And uh, this is an electron uh, uh, microscopy of the retina of a mouse model of hermansky pudlak syndrome that corresponds to one of the types that I am going to describe now. So this is the, uh, this is the retina here. And in the wild type uh, retina, you can see all of these pigment granules. Uh, but in the uh, hermansky pudlak syndrome model uh, mouse, there are very few of these pigment granules, and they look very abnormal. Uh, so this really implicates, OK, so I'm getting ahead of myself. So there is a defect in pigment granules, both in the eyes and also in the skin. Um, but in addition, this is not just like uh, the uh, regular albinism, where there is a defect in pigmentation. Uh, the, this, this is a syndromic disease where there are other problems. One of them is prolonged bleeding, and that's due to the absence of uh, dense granules in the platelets, uh, which suggests that there is a more generalized effect in lysosome-related organelles. And this can be seen by uh, performing whole mount electron microscopy of platelets from these patients where in a normal individual, you see these dark granules, which are the platelet-dense bodies, which are very important uh, for uh, stopping the bleeding. And as you can see here, the platelets from these patients have no uh, platelet-dense bodies. And in fact, this very cumbersome uh, EM assay was used as an assay to diagnose uh, hermansky pudlak syndrome in the past, although now there are uh, better ways of, of doing that. Now, in addition to uh, pigmentation and bleeding uh, problems, uh, many of these patients, or some anyway, uh, present with fibrosis of the lungs and inflammatory uh, colitis, which are much more serious uh, problems than pigmentation and bleeding. And in fact, it is these uh, problems that in some cases lead to death beginning in the fourth uh, decade of life. Now, the cause why these patients get fibrosis of the lung or, or inflammatory colitis is not very well understood. The pathogenesis is not well understood. Uh, one theory is that there is um, an inflammatory response to the accumulation of undegraded materials in cells of the reticular endothelial system. Uh, but this is just one of several hypotheses that are being um, Entertained. But this is the most serious symptom and the one that some clinical trials that have been conducted are trying to address in order to uh, help these patients. And finally, uh, there are other symptoms. 
facial dysmorphism, neutropenia, impair cytotoxic T cells and NK uh, responses, uh, frequent infections. And those are variable from patient to patient because as you are going to see, this is a genetically heterogeneous disease, highly heterogeneous. Mutations in different genes uh, cause similar or related disorders. So, um, so many years ago, more than a decade ago, uh, we had uh, the uh, great opportunity to collaborate uh, with a clinical investigator in our institute, Bill Gall, who was studying patients with hermansky uh, pudlak syndrome. And uh, we had insight about what the AP3 uh, complex did in cells and in model organisms. And, and uh, from an interaction between these groups, we were able to identify uh, mutations in one of the subunits of AP3, uh, the beta-3A subunit, in, uh, in a subset of patients with hermansky pudlak syndrome. So these, um, these mutations were not identified by positional cloning. They, are, they were identified by deduction from uh, the understanding of the function of this complex in cells and in model organisms, which led us to think that perhaps some patients with hermansky pudlak syndrome would have defects in this complex, and that turned out to be the case. Uh, so when um, the beta-3A subunit is mutated, uh, it's rapidly degraded in the cell, and the other subunits of the complex are also degraded, so these patients have low levels of uh, an AP3 complex that bears mutations in the beta-3A subunit. And when that happens, there is a defect in the sorting of tyrosinase, which is the uh, key enzyme for the biosynthesis of the melanin pigment. Tyrosinase is a transmembrane protein that has a dilucine sorting signal in its cytosolic tail that interacts with the AP3 complex. And, uh, and when there is no AP3, tyrosinase is not properly sorted to melanosomes, and that results in the pigmentation defect. We still do not know why there is also a platelet dense body defect or why there are other problems. And the hypothesis is that there will be cargos other than tyrosinase, which also have sorting signals that interact with AP3. But what those cargos that account for the platelet defect or the cytotoxic uh, granule defects are not known at present. Uh, now, um, as I said uh, a few minutes ago, and how am I doing with time? Okay, I'll, I'll go quickly now. Um, so, um, hermansky pudlak syndrome is a highly genetically heterogeneous disease. Mutations in different genes result in similar uh, diseases. And, and this is sort of a collage with pictures of uh, different patients that have been um, studied and treated here at the NIH. And the genes that are mutated in many of these patients have been identified by positional cloning in this case. And we now know that in addition to the beta 3A subunit of AP3, there are mutations in uh, eight other genes, HPS1 through 9. There is no 2 because 2 is beta 3A. That's hermansky pudlak syndrome type 2. Uh, HPS129 that were identified by positional cloning. Now, what's interesting and uh, challenging about these uh, proteins is that they are all novel proteins that had not been characterized prior to their identification as hermansky pudlak syndrome genes that have no homology to any other uh, protein. And for that reason, it's very hard to figure out what they do at the molecular and cellular level. And for that reason, we don't really understand very well what they do. But uh, what my lab and other labs um, uh, have done is to characterize these proteins biochemically. And what we have found, and when I say we, I, I mean uh, Esteban de Angelica, Michael Marx, uh, Graça Raposo, Victor Faundes, uh, Dick Swank, and many other uh, people, is to find that those HPS proteins uh, are components of three multi-subunit complexes that have been named block one, two, and three. And again, the molecular function of these complexes are, is not known, 
but they are believed to cooperate with AP3 to sort uh, cargo molecules uh, from these tubular endosomes to melanosomes and to platelet-dense bodies. And this is an area of very active research uh, at right now. Okay, and finally, I will end with a little bit of a discussion of AP1 defects in neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, and there are two neurodevelopmental disorders that are caused by mutations in AP1. One of them is known as the Mednick syndrome and is due to mutation in an isoform of sigma-1, one of the subunits of AP1, the sigma-1A subunit. Mednick is not the name of the physician who first described the disease. It's an acronym, which is actually very useful to remember what are the symptoms of this disease here mental retardation, enteropathy, deafness, neuropathy, ichthyosis, and keratodermia. So it affects mainly the brain, and it affects tissues that have epithelial cells. Brain, neurons, epithelial cells. That's consistent with work that we have done and others have done, showing that the AP1 complex mediates polarized sorting in neurons and epithelial cells, and that, lead us, uh, that leads us to think that these problems may be due to the uh, missorting of some protein to a domain of uh, neurons or epithelial cells, although this has yet to be demonstrated, and it's something that we and others are investigating. So mutations in one of the isoforms of the sigma-1 subunit of AP1, sigma-1A, cause this Mednick syndrome. But the sigma-1 subunit of AP1 occurs as three isoforms. So humans and mice have three isoforms of the subunit of AP1. And mutations in sigma-1b and other isoform are uh, the cause of this syndrome that had initially been characterized as two different clinical entities, but the cloning of the genes have revealed that they actually correspond to the same disease. And they are known as Fried syndrome or Pettigrew syndrome. Uh, it's an X-linked mental retardation syndrome that um, presents with uh, malformations in the cerebellum. Uh, there is also hydrocephalus, which is due to stenosis of the aqueduct of Sylvia. And there are a number of other uh, neurodevelopmental uh, problems. Um, and that results in uh, movement disorder uh, cerebral palsy and delayed motor development, hypotonia, and there are also behavioral and cognitive uh, problems. So it's really a very it's a syndromic uh, uh, disease. Okay, so as I said before, um, studies in, in cellular studies have shown that uh, the AP1 complex is involved in sorting cargos to the basolateral surface of polarized epithelial cells and the somatodendritic domain of neurons. So we hypothesize that in, um, in Mednick and the freed pedigree syndromes, there will be missorting of some cargo uh, proteins, some transmembrane proteins, uh, to some domain of uh, epithelial cells or neurons, and that that may be the cause of the uh, cutaneous or, or uh, intestinal uh, symptoms and the, uh, and the neurologic symptoms. But that's, again, something that uh, remains to be uh, investigated and established. Uh, now I would like to end um, by giving sort of uh, just showing uh, some, uh, talking about a recent paper that gives some hints as to what cargos might be missorted in at least one of these diseases, the Mednick syndrome. This is a very recent paper that was published uh, last year, I think, uh, in which they found, this group, found that in the Mednick syndrome, which is this neurocutaneous disorder that I've uh, talked about, uh, there are some additional phenotypes which have to do with copper metabolism. Uh, for instance, the patients have low levels of copper in, in the blood and low levels of ceruloplasmin, which is a protein that carries uh, copper in, in, the, uh, in the bloodstream. They exhibit liver copper accumulation and uh, hepatomegaly and increased levels of uh, transaminases and cholestases, 
which are all consistent with liver disease. And there are decreased levels of copper enzymes. And uh, interestingly, uh, when you put together the neuro neurocutaneous problems with these uh, liver uh, problems and, and a disorder of copper metabolism, suggests that this disease has characteristics of both Menke's disease and Wilson's disease, which are genetic disorders due to mutations in two copper transporters uh, known as ATP7A and ATP7B. So it's very likely that at least two of the cargos that might be missorted when there is a mutation in, uh, in sigma-1a are these two copper transporter transporting ATPases. Interestingly, both of these uh, ATPases have dilucin uh, signals in their cytosolic tails, and the sigma-1 subunit uh, is the subunit of the AP1 complex that recognizes dilucin signals. So we may um, have the hints of what might be a pathogenic mechanism for at least some of the uh, symptoms in, in these patients. And uh, in fact, the authors of uh, this paper that describe a copper metabolism defect in methnic patients um, show these data in which these are fibroblasts from a normal individual and, uh, and from two patients with methnic uh, disease, mutations in sigma-1a. And, and they looked at the localization of the ATP7A, the copper transporter ATPase that is mutated in Menke's disease. And what they found is that under basal conditions in a normal individual, the um, ATP7A protein is in the trans-Golgi network. But upon addition of high concentrations of copper, it redistributes to the cell surface. This is in normal fibroblasts. But in methnic uh, patient fibroblasts, the um, ATP7A protein is already, to some extent, uh, relocalized to the plasma membrane or to some compartment that is close to the plasma membrane. And addition of copper doesn't cause any redistribution of this, uh, of this protein, suggesting again that the AP1 complex, and in particular the sigma-1A subunit of this complex, regulates the intracellular trafficking uh, of the ATP7A protein. This is a case in which a cargo has been implicated in mediating uh, the defects in these diseases. Now, um, reading the paper, I'm not exactly sure how these findings in fibroblasts translate to neurons or to epithelial cells where uh, the defects are manifested as, as, uh, as the sim other symptoms of this disease, but that's something that would be uh, interesting to investigate. And the last slide uh, shows what provide, provides a little bit of hope for uh, treating at least some of the symptoms of these diseases. When one works on these rare diseases, many of which have these uh, very severe uh, problems, many of them are, um, are already inborn and they are developmental, you always wonder, uh, can understanding the molecular basis, the pathogenesis of these diseases help to treat at least some of the symptoms of these patients. And, and uh, in many cases, once uh, there is a developmental problem that has been established, it's very difficult to, uh, to change development. But there are certain symptoms that might possibly be treated. And I think that this same paper that describes the copper metabolism defects in, in methnic patients provides a hint that we might be able to help with some of these symptoms. Uh, now, the Wilson's disease, uh, which is due to mutations in the ATP7B uh, transported and that causes liver uh, problems, the accumulation of copper in the liver, is treated with uh, zinc acetate. And um, so what zinc acetate does is to uh, increase intestinal cell methylothionine. Uh, which is a protein that complexes copper. So when the intestinal epithelial cell takes up copper from the diet, uh, so part of it is sequestered by methylothionine. And what the addition of zinc does is to increase the levels of methionine so that more of the dietary copper is, is sequestered in the intestinal epithelial cell. Less goes into the, uh, into the bloodstream 
and less ends up accumulating in the liver. And therefore, it ameliorates uh, the uh, problems uh, caused by accumulation of copper in the liver. So what these um, investigators did was to treat one patient, only one patient, uh, with Mednick disease, a mutation in sigma-1a with zinc copper. And what they found is that there was normalization of plasma transaminases, which are an indicator of liver health, and, um, and bile acid levels in the blood. And there was also reduced liver copper overload. So it effectively treated the liver uh, problems in Mednick disease. And, but even most importantly, it also improved some of the behavioral disturbances and cognitive function and itching because of the uh, cutaneous problems. So these symptoms are either secondary to the liver problem, and by treating the, the liver uh, problems, you also get an improvement in these, um, uh, in these problems, or the zinc acetate treatment is also uh, leading to a, a, uh, having a primary effect on other cell types like the neurons, or the epithelial cells uh, that uh, are the, uh, the cells that are most compromised in this disease. So again, I just want to leave you uh, with, uh, uh, with a very brief uh, uh, take home message. So all of these protein codes that were initially uh, studied biochemically and because of their role in intracellular uh, protein trafficking have now been shown to be defective in a number of genetic diseases that affect different organ systems. Many of them affect the, uh, the uh, central nervous system, and that may be because neurons, uh, which are highly polarized cells that uh, have axons that can reach up to one meter in length, are very heavily dependent on protein trafficking in order to maintain the, uh, the functions of the different domains uh, of, uh, of the neurons. And uh, again, in, in the cases where mutations have been described, they involve mutations in an isoform uh, of one of the subunits, or they uh, involve a point mutation that results in a uh, protein with uh, lower but still some level of activity or they involve the mutation of a protein that is not essential for life, uh, but that is essential for the maintenance of some very important uh, functions. How do you want to do it? Questions now or after uh, Craig? That was fantastic. Uh, <clears throat> you have? Uh, I, I would ask if you're asking a question Please speak loudly because there are many, many people who are online and they send me nasty, not nasty, but they send me emails saying we hear the answers but we don't hear the questions. Well, I'll repeat the question yeah. just okay. in case. So do you have uh, questions? Yes. Want to hear? From a lay person, but thank you. Thank you for coming to Thank this you. meeting. You yeah. talked about, um, with AP3, um, the hermansky pudiak syndrome, and right. you talked about a clinical trial with the, um, the lung fibrosis. Could you say anything about that? Uh, yeah, that was published. Uh, the, the one trial that I know was conducted by Bill Gold and, uh, here at the NIH. Uh, he was at NICHD. Now he is in the Genome Institute. And it involved an anti-inflammatory drug uh, that's uh, called pyrfenidone, and I think it showed some promising uh, effects, but I, I don't know what the current status of that is, uh, whether it's been taken through, uh, through other phases or, or not. But that's one, uh, one trial that I heard about. And in fact, a few years ago, uh, Bill Gold and I shared one of these, uh, these talks, and uh, there was a hermansky putlak syndrome patient who came and, and, and talked to the... Uh, and she to, was in your slide. ...to the audience. Uh, I think she is in the slide. And, um, and I think that at the time, I think Bill talked about this, uh, this trial. But I don't know how far it's being taken. So what's the relationship of 
increased iron in the basal ganglia in Mednick syndrome? Is there an implication that iron metabolism is also... Impaired? Well, I don't know, but in the same way that, uh, you know, copper metabolism is altered, uh, maybe there are problems with some iron transporter as well in this disease. And, uh, you know, a lot of this information that I am presenting is very, very uh, recent and uh, from the past two or three years. So there are so many things that we don't know. Uh, so it will be interesting to, to see whether there are also problems with um, the iron metabolism um, pathways. Is it possible to make targeted knockouts in mice of, of these? Uh, yeah, in some cases there are. In some cases there are. Uh, Steve has a question, but I, I'd like to, to also mention something else. Uh, I, I recently wrote a little essay on, on the Nobel Prize winners, and uh, I've heard this assertion many times that, uh, well, now that they won the Nobel Prize, uh, protein trafficking is, is not interesting. Uh, you know, all the fundamental principles have been discovered. Uh, so let's move on and do something else. And when you begin to tease out, I mean, all of these diseases, you realize how little we understand about how these codes are functioning, what their cargos are, uh, what the roles of those cargos are in different tissues. There is so much more to be investigated and to be learned. Uh, so, so by all means, we should remain engaged in the study of these uh, of these uh, intracellular trafficking processes. Okay. Thanks. I, I may be wrong, but I, I think on your slides, in terms of uh, Wynn's point about the iron deposition, that that applied to the to the freed or pedigree yeah, syndrome. Right. right. But that's interesting, the iron deposition in the basal ganglia, because as you yeah. know, in patients with acerulaplasmanemia, um, there's iron deposition. And in, on occasion, in Wilson disease patients, Right. It can be basal ganglia ion deposition. So it would be interesting in, in these patients to look for the uh, right. copper metabolism status, although I don't know whether to expect that there would be a problem or not. Maybe sigma-1A is the one that is dedicated yeah. to sort the ATP7 proteins, and sigma-1B sorts some other carbs. That's the other thing that's so intriguing. So you get these two phenotypes that you know, are sort of similar, but one with with the 1A and the other with the 1B. Right. Uh, yet, um, you know, why can't they sort of cross-cover each other? Yeah, I think they are the cross-covering each other to, to a very large extent. Because we know that if you mutate the gamma adapting subunit, one subunit of AP1 in mouse, it's embryonic lethal. So AP1 is essential for life, for viability. In these diseases, you see mutations in a single isoform from one of the subunits. So I think they compensate to a very, very large extent, except for those processes that only, are only dependent on one of these subunits. And that's why we have three of these isoforms, because to a small extent, they have a very specific function, probably in sorting some very specific cargos. I just have one other quick question that I'll tell you. Do you have any sense of, like, the number of proteins per uh, complex? Like, 1,000 or 50? Isoforms? Well, no, or the number of cargo proteins. Oh, so like, no, we don't know. I mean, up until now, um, the identification of cargos for the different comp complexes um, has been done in a uh, sort of a random uh, manner. There has been no systematic effort to identify all the cargos that interact with AP1, AP2, or AP3. But that's something that should be done. And, and there are, I have some thoughts about how that could be done. But it's, it's an effort that at some point uh, should be undertaken. Because I'm sure that will shed light on, on um, some of these diseases. Okay, well. Thank you very Thank you. much, Juan. And we can ask more questions at the end. So Sorry if I took too much of your time. Perfect. Perfect, thanks. So 
again, thank all of you for coming uh, and learning about adapter proteins. It's a, a pleasure for me to be here, and to, I learned a tremendous amount about these proteins from, from Juan's talk. Um, I've been a neurologist for about 20 years, and over that time, I've had the benefit of really seeing two different eras in medicine. And you know, when I trained initially, and I'll use neurology as an example, but it probably applies to other aspects of medicine, is we primarily, you know, we're we diagnose symptoms. Patients come in with a problem. We do our examination, do some tests to diagnose symptoms. Um, and we treat symptoms. And most of neurology is based on that theme. Our subspecialties are movement disorders, cognitive disorders, neuromuscular disorders. They're essentially uh, based on treating the symptom in that area of the body or in that area of the nervous system and seeing if it gets better. But what we need in neurology, and like in all of medicine, is we need to be able to diagnose diseases before patients have significant symptoms. It's very hard to reverse system, uh, symptoms in the nervous system. If somebody has lost a lot of cognitive function, it's very hard to restore that. Um, so I think that the second era of neurology and medicine was really prompted by, and let me see if I can find my slides, was uh, by the Human Genome Project. And again, that was finished in about 2003 at a cost of $3 billion. But really, since that time, there's been just a tremendous amount of innovation in genetics, in ethics, in you know, diagnosis of, of, of disorders, uh, and a lot of areas directly related to medicine that have really benefited us all. And in that time, in about the past 10 years, I think there's been about 2,000 disease genes identified of which probably close to 1,000 of them have some aspect of, of dysfunction in the nervous system. So, so as we mentioned earlier, you know, we, we, you know, we had a lot of diseases over time, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, things, that were really diagnosed pathologically or by the symptoms that we see. But that didn't necessarily give us disease mechanisms. And I think one of the great advantages of genetic diagnosis, as, as again, as, as Juan showed very nicely, is that we learn a lot about basic biology from, uh, from studying the genes that, that are involved in disease. And not only do we learn about biology, we learn about maybe the pathways that we need to treat to prevent the disease from even coming, to prevent the symptoms uh, from, from having a big impact. And I think of all of the innovations that uh, came out of the Genome Project, the one that benefits me the most and probably uh, is responsible for many of the, um, the ability to diagnose diseases so quickly has been this revolution in human genetics. And um, this, the way we sequence DNA for patients is very, very different than the classic Maxim, Gilbert, and Sanger sequencing that people did so many years ago. Now we have all these different ways to do next generation sequencing, they call it. And now we're even up, coming up to third generation sequencing. And I won't go through, I, I picked an old article on purpose because I didn't want to favor any one company's platform over another. So these are all, ob most of the, many of these are obsolete by now. Uh, but essentially, what we can do now is we sequence in massive parallel. Um, amounts, and we can generate huge amounts of, of sequence data at a very low cost. And if you think about medicine or research or anything like that, how many areas can you think of where we've had orders and orders of magnitude of improvement in our ability to get sequencing at the same time that the price has gone down by orders of magnitude? It's, very, it's a very unusual situation. So that in the future, we'll be able to get this kind of sequencing information for really almost pennies compared to the thousands and thousands of dollars that we would have to pay uh, in the past. And that, that um, ability to sequence DNA cheaply has fundamentally changed neurogenetics programs like, like mine. Uh, in the past, the, this is what a pedigree would look like. You'd have nice uh, multi-generation families. You'd have many affected. And for those of you that don't read these frequently, um, uh, if you're affected, it's usually dark, uh, colored in dark. If you're a, a woman, it's a, a circle. If you're a, a male, it's a square. And if we want to keep uh, confidentiality, we make it a, um, you know, a, a diamond so that no one can look back and identify these very large families uh, because there may not be that many with the right number of kids and so on. These were typically autosomal dominant disorders where about half the people were affected. And this is actually from a, a paper we did with uh, an Aust Austrian group a couple years ago. But you can see all these people are affected. And all the affecteds have the mutation, and none of the unaffecteds do. So that was the classic way of doing genetics. And the advantage is it was almost always right. We had these giant families. There was all these affecteds. It was, you know, your odds of being wrong were very low. We would usually generate what are called log scores. You'd be able to narrow down an area of the genome to a small number of genes, sequence them, and find the variation. Um, it's changed now. Now we're much more likely to see 
a, a pedigree like this. We can do tiny families because no longer is the limiting factor the ability to sequence DNA. Now the limiting factor is the ability to analyze it. We can sequence the entire genome, all the exomes, which are the, the, the coding sequences, for very little money. We don't have to you know, spend lots of money doing classic Sanger sequencing on small regions. We now have the ability to uh, basically sequence uh, all genomes in, in small families and identify genes. But our challenge is different now. Our challenge is to true uh, prove pathogenicity. And of course, that's where understanding the biology comes in. We can test our mutations using biological methods as one way to be more certain that we've identified a new uh, a causative gene. I just wanted to use um, one of the things that Juan used uh, very nicely, you know, again, that the Nobel Prize this year went to trafficking, uh, and maybe use the same example in a different way. And, and as you can see that I have written up there that Randy Sheckman discovered these genes encoding proteins that are key regulators of vesicle trafficking, as we heard. Uh, and he did that by comparing normal yeast to genetically mutated yeast in which trafficking was disturbed. Uh, and then that's how he identified these genes to control transport in different compartments and, and so on. Well, we can do the same with people now. We can do the same with human disease, and much faster than they could do 20 years ago with yeast. Uh, we could easily study human disease, how that's affected uh, you know, phenotypes that we see, and very different types of phenotypes. I mean, from one of the things that, um, that Juan had mentioned about nerves can be a, a meter long. A yeast cell, let's say, is three microns. So if you want to study polarity, you can study it in a three micron yeast, or you can study it in a in a one meter long neuron, which is 300,000 fold greater distance that it has to cover. So we might be able to pull out uh, different kinds of phenotypes, different kinds of insights into cell biology mechanisms that are directly related to, to human disease. Uh, so we can use many of the same ideas, the same approaches that were used so successfully in other model systems and now apply them to humans. So the disease I'm going to talk a little bit about, it just happened to fit into the adapter protein um, uh, theme, and I could have picked a few other themes as well, and it's the hereditary spastic paraplegias. And for those of you that aren't neurologists, um, I can diagnose this. I have one little prop with just this in less than a minute, if you had this wrong with you. Because spastic paraplegia is essentially something you can see when people walk. They walk a very specific way with their legs sort of scissoring. Um, spasticity is something you can feel in somebody's leg. If you move it at different rates, you can feel what they call a spastic catch. Uh, it differs from a, a other muscle tone abnormalities like Parkinson's where it's more like a lead pipe, they call it. It's it just rigid. In, in, it, we, again, it, we, you could do it in five seconds. We could tell the difference. Uh, and just watching somebody walk, we could tell. So we can do the diagnosis of the clinical syndrome in about one minute, but we spend the other hour trying to see associated symptoms because one of the things about hereditary spastic paraplegia is it can occur in isolation where you have just problems walking, or it can occur with associated symptoms. And I think in the future, those associated symptoms are going to be the key to doing the really careful sort of phenotypic and genotype relationships that we're going to need in the future. So if you uh, think about what spastic paraplegia is, like most neurological diseases, the name describes what you see. Spasticity is an abnormality in muscle tone that localizes to neurons that start in your cerebral cortex and they go down the spinal cord and they synapse on what are called lower motor neurons that actually control your muscles. So I'll go to meetings sometimes and hear people talking about this is a muscle disorder. Those muscles are fine. There's very little weakness in the spastic paraplegia. Uh, so it's different than a spinal cord injury where you might injure the whole cord and injure all these pathways. It's really a very selective disruption of this uh, pathway. And the reason you, it only affects the legs is it, it's length dependent. It affects the longest nerves first. Those are the ones that go all the way down to your legs. The ones that control your respiratory function and your uh, arms are up here. They're much shorter. So it starts in the legs and gradually works its way up. Um, it's, a, it's not super rare. It's about three to nine out of 100,000 people. And I've seen hundreds of these patients here at the NIH. Uh, so, and, uh, but one of the really most dramatic things about it, and this number is about to go way up in, in, by next week, is that there's about 60 different genes identified. So if you think about that, I mean, how many diseases like Alzheimer's and stuff, you might have a couple genes. We have the ability now to take these 60 genes and, and try to understand what pathways are involved. Because there's certainly not going to be 60 different distinct uh, 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 pathogenic uh, 
pathways, it's going to be a small number of common themes. Uh, and again, we only know about, uh, we're up around 40 gene products known. Uh, so that's a really, there aren't many diseases that give us this, uh, this advantage, but also there aren't many diseases that affect a cell that's a meter long. So again, it, it's a very uniquely human um, phenotype that allows us to understand perhaps different cell biology pathways than you might identify studying other model organisms. So one of the things we can do pretty easily, and I've, I've done it here, it was a review from a, a year or so ago, and it's already, there's more genes, is we can sort of uh, consolidate these into a couple main themes. And as you can see across the top, I have, um, you know, like uh, organelle trafficking is a very big one, or shaping. And as Juan said, you know, you have, if you're thinking about a traffic, trafficking defect, well, that's going to affect a big cell much more than a small one because the distribution challenges are so much greater. Uh, and as you can see, there's a couple proteins on here, like AP4 uh, and AP5 that, that wanted mentioned, as well as SPG11 and SPG15. And it turns out that in AP4, as Juan also mentioned, that, that these are multiple, um, there's multiple different uh, uh, components. It's a heterotetramer. But all the different subunits, I think all of them now, have been identified as causative. So you can, it really does tell you that this is a converging theme, because if you mutate any one of them, you get the same disease. And it really does tell you that it's the A4, A4 complex and not some special function of one subunit or another. Uh, and, but, but one of the differences, I think, that, that I'm going to uh, emphasize a little bit throughout um, my talk is that in the most cases, like AP1 through 4, uh, we really learned about um, the this, you know, uh, we, we found the genes were already there. The, the people already understand what the APs did. What we didn't, and when we found the mutations, we could say, okay, this is what, what's affected. But AP5 is different, and I think is a sort of a harbinger of the future, is that it was identified based on this disease. It wasn't identified biochemically. It was identified when it was identified in a patient, and the links were made both uh, biochemically and clinically after that initial identification. And I think you're going to see more of that in the future. We're going to be able to identify pathways with disease. And, and really, a lot of the cell biology is going to emanate from that, which is, again, the opposite of the way it was uh, in the past. So again, I've just got, uh, sometimes when you think about neurons, you know, I always make the axon look big because a lot of disorders of the nervous system affect axons. I mean, it's well over 99% of the cell uh, body, of, of the uh, so total cellular uh, volume is in the axons in these long things. And you can just see there's all these things that have to be transported up and down. There's myelination that has to, uh, that has to cover the axons to allow them to conduct uh, impulses. And uh, again, as you can see, we can sort of uh, break it down into different types of organelles that are involved in these. And I think it becomes important for us as clinicians to really see, you know, can we do genotype phenotype correlations? Can we really, you know, see subtle differences maybe in different types of paraplegia that will allow us to, you know, even better sort of hone in on mechanisms that are relevant for the different types? Because it's probably not one disease, it's certainly not 70 different ones, but it's not one either. There's probably a small number, and it's very important for us to be able to generate the kind of clinical information that allows us to see relationships uh, that might give us uh, you know, new ideas to test at the cell biology level. So one of the things that, again, Juan went over very nicely what adapter proteins are, so I don't have to do that at all. Uh, but one thing that, that sort of struck me as interesting is you can see AP1, AP2, and AP3, and these are all different species different, like uh, Homo sapiens might be S. Uh, and you can see AP1 through 3 are very conserved, but AP4 and 5 may be less so. Uh, and those are the two I'm going to uh, show you in terms of neurological disease. And even if and this is a, a, a review from uh, Jenny Hurst uh, uh, a couple of years ago, you can see that uh, they try to sort of estimate how many of these proteins are, are within a cell. And AP1, 2, and 3, very, very high. And look at 4 and 5 down here. And this is a typical HeLa cell. So what that could tell you is that maybe a HeLa cell is not the best way to study these proteins. Uh, but the fact that they're mutated in human disease with really pretty, uh, very striking uh, symptoms, I think tells us that uh, that might be the way, way to study it. We might want to use the human disease to, as, as our primary way to study these two new complexes. I'm not going to spend as much time on, on AP4 mutations. Juan, again, already showed a bit about it. I just wanted to mention, again, just to build a little bit on, the, on, on what he said was the uh, 
you know, the, the sort of the primary phenotype. And as he said, that you know, you can have recessive mutations. So these are loss of function, and these are what are commonly found when you do the uh, exome sequencing because many of its greatest advantages are working in consanguineous populations where inter individual variation is less. So uh, you're able to isolate the disease gene earlier, and you also know that it's on both alleles. So it allows you to sort of separate all the noise from just regular human genetic variation from, from disease. And so these are often done um, and increasingly done in, in, in the Middle East because the families tend to be big. Uh, big families uh, with uh, intermarriage uh, makes it a lot easier to find uh, these genes. And in many cases, these populations haven't been looked at as carefully uh, until recently. So one of the things you can see is that uh, it's somebody, these are different patients, all with AP4 uh, mutations. They have sort of coarse facial features. They have very abnormal feet. Uh, again, as Juan said, these are, in, in many cases, have prominent developmental abnormalities at a young age. So you know, these are the kind of disorders that are the hardest, because even if we could identify it, the question is, is could, you know, how much intervention could we really do? But fortunately, there are many forms that do occur later in life and where we have much more time uh, to potentially intervene. So again, these mutations, you get a similar clinical phenotype with mutations in any one of the components, which makes sense. Now, another thing to beware a little bit about is that this is in one population. So what we always like is when we find these same, muta uh, same gene mutated in different types of populations, because that allows us to really hone in on what might be the core features of a syndrome. Sometimes if you rely too much on uh, one population, you might get you know, a sort of a skewed view of what the, the, the predominant uh, symptomatology would be. So again, as, um, uh, as Juan mentioned, this SPG48 uh, protein AP5Z1, when it was first published, it, was, it had one of these generic KIAA names because they didn't know what it did. Uh, and that was sort of, and what, but what they found in that original paper that was a clinical description is they found the interaction with SPG11 and 15. And as Juan also mentioned, the, the, the really sort of what, remarkable thing about that is that clinically these diseases are all very similar. Uh, and then if we think about 70 different forms of hereditary spastic paraplegia, there's very, very few of them that have Parkinsonism, and these all do. Uh, so I've seen patients with every one of these forms. Um, the, AP, the SPG48 patient I saw within the past few months, there's never been one reported in the United States. So these are not common diseases. But, um, but we've seen many SPG11 and SPG15 patients here, and many of them through Bill Gall's uh, Undiagnosed Diseases Program. So these patients are out there, and we have the ability to get cell lines and things from them, you know, to really, again, to really build on, on, on using uh, patients to really understand basic biology. I hope so. I get to use this one. Okay. So, oops, wrong way. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about one of these cases because I know that one of the things that everyone like, and many of you I know are basic scientists, is we'd like to see, you know, what can we learn from studying patients clinically? What do we look for? And, um, you know, how do we approach them? And the patients couldn't come today, but I can tell you because they, they live a long way away and they're worried about weather. Uh, and, uh, but I, I saw a family, it was the pedigree I showed you, it's right up there, A, uh, where two people, uh, not consanguineous, uh, had two children with a very, very severe form of hereditary spastic paraplegia, started in their teens. So up till then they were athletic. They weren't doing great in school, but not bad. And over a period of 10 years have now become wheelchair bound uh, and really, you know, have, you can't work anymore. So this is a, actually a fairly severe form of it. Um, but what's interesting is that some of the things that we look for that I think give us some of the greatest clues about pathogenesis are things that the patients don't complain about. So one thing to remember about the way we approach patients with these diseases is sometimes some of the key things that differentiate one patient from another might not be something that they ever complain about. So partly by looking at other, other cases or even some of similar cellular mechanisms, it sort of prompts us to look at certain things. Um, and I can tell you that uh, this is an eye. I think you've seen that. Uh, what they have that's going to be hard to see is a mild cataracts. Uh, now, a 20-something-year-old person doesn't usually have a cataract. But this cataract doesn't look like a normal one either. It doesn't look like one you get when you're older. It look, it's very patchy, and it looks like one you get with a lysosomal storage disease. So again, we can start making links between other types of patients we've seen. And if you look at their uh, retina, and again, I, unfortunately, this is going to be very hard to see at this distance, and their visual acuity is normal. They didn't have any complaints at all. But if you look here, and I, and I know you're not going to be able to see this, there's these very, very small uh, flecks that are yellow in the retina. It spares the macula, and they're around here. So this is where your central vision is. We see them around here. 
uh, and they almost look like they form a reticulum a little bit. Uh, if you, but you really have to look closely, and if anyone wants to see, I can show it to you on a computer. You'll see it better. Uh, and this is a autofluorescence image. But another thing they have that's much easier to see uh, is a very distinct um, uh, finding on MRI. Their corpus callosum is almost gone. And as Awan mentioned, that thin corpus callosum is one of the features, and these are the brother and sister. And they also have a very unusual white matter change, this little thing at the top of the ventricles. So this is a coronal section through the brain. You know, so you're kind of cutting this way um, through. And, uh, and it's right at the very front part of the brain right here. And these, see this little white matter abnormality? It's called the ears of the lynx sign. And that was actually identified here by Joe Mazdu in, in a, NIMH. So he saw a bunch of these patients and noticed this abnormality that, that relates closely to the thinning of the corpus callosum. So again, these are not things that patients are complaining about, but these are very valuable things for us to, uh, to uh, acquire in terms of trying to relate this to other forms of paraplegia and to try to link what might be you know, proteins that are working through the same pathway. Uh, so that's a, one of the, and this is a very, very common thing you'll see in SPG15. Now again, one of the really remarkable things is I'm gonna show you SPG11. And if you see the MRIs, and these are not my cases, I've, I've referenced the, the journal's articles that these are from, you'll, still, you'll see here, maybe not as prominent as what I showed, but you'll see that you can see this, here's the link sign on MRI, and, and their corpus callosum, very, very thin, almost gone. And they also saw the same retinal findings. And this is a different gene, but it's the identical clinical disease. So how can we make sense of that um, cell biologically or at a cellular level? Uh, and it's not so hard uh, because uh, they also have a very uh, shared feature. Now, Juan mentioned that, um, that you know, SPG, uh, AP5 has been linked sort of to the endosomal to lysosomal pathway. And one of the things that we can do to sort of bridge this gap between clinical care and patient studies uh, and patient studies and cell biology is to actually use cells from patients. So all the patients we see, we biopsy their skin. Uh, and I'll show you what we, we can do lots with that, not just look at the cells themselves, but we have lots of things we can do to really try to use the, the patients that we see to model the disease that they have. And one of the things that you'll notice and, uh, is, uh, is if you look at uh, one, uh, there's three patients, uh, there's three people here. 2-1 is an unaffected sibling, and 2 and 3 are the people with disease. You can see if you look at sorting next and 1, there's no difference. However, if you look at LAMP1, which labels uh, lysosome-related structures as well as lysosomes, you'll see the lysosomes are gigantic in the two patients. If you measure them, it's much bigger. So we've converted, at least to some degree, a clinical disease, and now we can understand a little bit at least one cellular abnormality that we can see. And even though the skin is not involved in the disease, we can see the abnormality there. And that's something that's important to remember. Neurological diseases are not only things that are brain-specific. Oftentimes, they're just worse manifestations of a problem that might exist in other cells, and oftentimes we can study it in other cell types. So again, if you take another look, uh, you can see that uh, the, this is with a lysosome stain, and you can see these big black holes in the two patients. And if you do an electron microscopy, you see all this storage material. And that's what you see in lysosomal storage disease, but this is not one of those. So it really causes us to rethink you know, uh, that we're gonna have another type of lysosomal storage disorder based on, on what we've seen so far. But one of the fascinating things about this disease too is that if you recall, one of the things we noticed in their eyes was evidence of, of things that you would see in somebody with one of these lysosomal disorders. So by using sort of those clinical insights and comparing it to the cell biology, I think we're gonna be able to really narrow down what part of the cell, uh, of the cell is disrupted in this disease and to really you know, identify new partners that are gonna be playing a role in its pathogenesis. So this is just, again, another figure uh, from actually J. Rock Chang, who's in the audience today, uh, showing that SPG11 has the same uh, abnormality in these lysosomal structures. So uh, you know, if we wanna say, well, what, what would be the final uh, proof that these are the same disease, it'd be the next slide, and that if you take patient cell lines from SPG15 and 11, and you look, it's hard to do these on Westerns because they're very big proteins, they're gigantic. There's a cross-reacting band at the top and there's the second one down is the real one. It's gone in both patients. So in other words, if you have SPG11, your SPG15 protein degrades too. So you essentially have, in both patients have essentially the same protein composition. They've lost both of these uh, 
SPG11 and, and 15 proteins, and that explains why clinically they look identical. And there's no way to tell these patients apart uh, between SPG15 and 11, and that's borne out at the cellular level. So uh, one of the things that we've been able to do is we now know that SPG1115 and SPG48 are a new type of trafficking disorder that somehow involves lysosomes. Now, again, it could be at other stages, but the thing we're seeing right now is lysosomes. If we want to uh, characterize this clinically, we could say it has early onset, more rapidly progressive uh, than most types we see, a thin corpus callosum, these ocular findings, this ears of the link sign on MRI, cognitive decline, and most distinctive among the HSPs is Parkinsonism. So what that does from a patient care point of view is most of our treatments are, um, are symptomatic. You know, we, we see spasticity, we can treat it a few different ways. Um, but in many cases, if somebody has extensive spasticity, it's hard to appreciate the Parkinsonism. So if they have one of these forms, we always try them on one of the Parkinsonian drugs, like Cinemet, and many times they get better. So we can use some of these distinctions to help us treat our patients. Uh, and so again, biologically, they have something similar, zebra bodies or this EM abnormality. But what I think is interesting is how can we take what we've learned from these patients and how can we learn even more about cell biology? What more can we contribute to understanding these pathways? Well, we can try to find other diseases. Now, there's another disease that's uh, it's, it's called, part, it's called a form of Parkinsonism that also has early onset Parkinsonism. Pyramidal signs, essentially, is spasticity uh, and is caused by mutation in a lysosomal protein. So this is just one example. So we can take our clinical syndrome and see what else it matches up with. And we might be able to empirically try to find new pathways or new proteins involved in the same pathway uh, doing this. And again, that's not that much different than people did historically for any trafficking thing. It's just now our phenotypes are human phenotypes rather than model organisms. And again, uh, as Juan showed, you know, you have this really nice uh, sort of these, these adapter proteins linking cargos and coats. Well, as he also said, it's not easy to find these sometimes. It's not easy to identify them. But if we have patients who have similar findings, these, the, you know, th this might be one way we can do it. We might have patients with uh, Parkinsonism and spasticity and be able to identify some of these components to add to all the beautiful biochemical and cell biology studies over the years. It just gives one more weapon in the sort of way to understand these uh, illnesses. It gives us the chance to use the patient's disease genes that we identify. Um, so sort of as a last slide or two, uh, I just want to mention one of the other ways that we, we, uh, we in our lab and others can link the human disease to uh, to cell biology, and that is that everybody's skin cells uh, now have almost infinite potential. So we take skin cells from basically every patient we see, and we make them into stem cells. Uh, and you can reprogram them very easily, and we do this in collaboration with uh, a colleague at the University of Connecticut, but NIH has great facilities for it as well. Uh, and what we can do with that is we can make them into neurons. Uh, we can make them into any, basically any type of cell you want. So it, it allows us to think much more broadly in terms, and, and we've already had the mutation in these cells. So we're able to think much more broadly about different types of cellular studies that we can do by having the ability to take a direct human uh, neuronal or other cell type model and study it directly in terms of the biology. Uh, and just to, to give you one example, this isn't from one of these diseases, but it's similar, is that um, one of our diseases, uh, these are, this is one of the stem cells made into neurons. You have these really long axons, and this is from one of our patients with another form, and they're much shorter. So if you look at the skin cell, it's identical, but once you make it into a relevant cell like a neuron, you start to see massive abnormalities. So, uh, so we're able to, again, this is the type of cell we want to study the cell biology in, maybe not the skin cell. So again, I think that by using iPS cells and, and stem cells derived from patients, it gives us one more way to bring these, these areas together, to bring clinical medicine to cell biology. And also, again, sort of the opposite of what Juan said in terms of we, we, can, we can use uh, human disease to teach us biology. So, uh, the, so my final slide is just a, few, a little summary. I think that one of the most important things that's really uh, facilitated all the types of works both of us talked about today is the advances in genetics that allow us to investigate di these different kinds of phenotypes that are somewhat uniquely human. That adapter proteins are mutated in a range of diseases, as, as Juan showed, but there are these converging themes that we can use to better understand cellular function that advances in stem cell biology really allow us to create human models for disease and also cell biology studies, so working on 
the sort of the corollary is we, as we study disease pathogenesis and, and try to figure out how we're going to treat it, it's going to intersect strongly even more so with the basic biology that we're doing at the same time. And I think rare diseases in particular may offer unusual opportunities because these haven't been studied as much and now they're much easier to study. So I think uh, when I was uh, visiting with one of the drug companies recently, they were saying that they considered rare genetic variants the most promising area for drug development of anything. So I think that even though these patients are rare, the insights they can give us into biology and in terms of, of mechanisms are going to have uh, obviously benefits much greater than, the, than the, the rare diseases that they have. So that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, we have Anyone some have time. I hope that there'll be some questions or comments after these extraordinary talks. Sure. I mean, this is certainly a far cry from the, I guess, in the 18th century where everybody said, we'll just wait for the autopsy. Well, that's what they used to do, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so this is lovely. <laughs> this is beautiful. Uh, so what we're seeing here is a lot of excitement uh, for the direct diagnosis, sometimes mm -hmm. of, of very difficult to diagnose mm -hmm. diseases by sequencing. Mm -hmm. So you're either going to sequence the whole exome or mm -hmm. Lord knows the whole genome. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this, if medicine is headed in this direction, mm -hmm. uh, that suggests larger and larger expenditures. <laughs> um, what what do you think about the future of, of this sort of approach is in the realities of modern medical economics? Well, I think that it's certainly the genetic testing gets cheaper as time goes on. Now, so we have this information. I, I think our hope is that if we can identify risk factors, again, that we can start treating people before they have their first stroke, before they have their first heart attack. The expense comes with those kind of uh, things. If we can prevent those, like, with, like aspirin probably saves more lives than uh, bypass surgeries, but look where all the money goes. Um, we're hoping to be able to identify risk factors to people and that this would be part of your sort of exam. You'd go to the doctor and they'd basically do these, uh, these analyses uh, and they'd say maybe you're at more risk for this or maybe we need to start treating you even before you have the symptom. Uh, and I know that sounds weird, but that's really what medicine is about, is about prevention. And we're hoping to be able to do that. And it's particularly in the nervous system, you know, we know that many times with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, people don't get that till their 40s, 50s, 60s. We have a lot of time to intervene. So I think our hope is that even one or two years, if you can prevent that, that saves society a tremendous amount of money. So I think of all, of all specialties, I, I would hope that genetics is the one that can bring the cost down. Because again, unlike everything else in medicine, as it gets better, it gets cheaper. So I was curious, in the uh, <coughs> uh, spastic mm -hmm. plegia patients who <coughs> you treated with uh, anti-Parkinsonian, mm -hmm. so w is that treating a symptom in the sense in terms of their spasticity and their Parkinson's aspects, but does the disease itself progress or are you influence? It's a very good point. No, I, I, we think it's the same as Parkinson's. One of the hardest things about being a neurologist is that even though you have a symptomatic therapy, the disease is always progressing on, behind that. So you're always, you know, you're always going to get harder and harder to treat the symptoms. In this case, actually, Bill Gall saw a bunch of patients and they saw, they published a paper, I think it was on SPG11, and they were actually able to show in the patients that they have dopamine metabolite abnormalities. So we had direct evidence that that was something we could treat. And based on all that and some other studies and the clear Parkinsonism that you see in these patients, that part gets better, the spasticity doesn't. So it's, again, it's, it's, it's affecting different parts of the nervous system, but it's also by understanding the disease presentation, it allows us, because we don't always look for that, when sometimes people see the spastic paraplegia and stop looking for anything else. So we can help them symptomatically, but obviously it's not what we want. We really want to be able to prevent the progression, and it doesn't do that. Is there anything that can be done that influences the course of the spastic diplegia itself? Uh, not really. I mean, one of the hopes, like when I show some of the stem cell abnormalities, we have been able to reverse some of those in some of our, our, our model systems. Our hope is that that's what we're trying to do. But right now, the only therapies for spastic paraplegia are things like baclofen, which can be through a pump through your, into your back, or it can be an oral medication. And again, that's just, or even an injection of something like botulinum toxin to weaken the muscles. 
it, it's purely symptomatic. It doesn't affect the, it doesn't improve the progression at all. None of, uh, for any of them actually. Well, I think there's a big, one big advantage to uh, stem cell the derived neurons, as you may know, is that they last a lot longer in culture. I mean, we can, we can go six months. A, a, a cell from a mouse, a primary cell, you know, within three to four weeks is starting to die. Uh, so we can go, you know, if we think these are age dependent, we can actually study time a lot better. And we can also differentiate these into different types of neurons. We can sort of target these for telencephalic, like the type that are involved in this disease. So we can differentiate into multiple different types of neurons, not just one. Uh, but also, um, mice are a challenge because uh, it's hard to model a disease of some, uh, first a human disease, but also you know, our corticospinal tract, uh, the organization of the motor system is different in a mouse. Uh, and also a mouse is only this big, and he, you know, so we'll never be able to, when we try to model these diseases in mice, they tend not to have much of a phenotype. And in fact, they shouldn't because their neurons are nowhere near as long as ours are. So uh, mouse models haven't been good. And I, I think that especially when we're thinking about compounds or you know, things that would be pharmaceuticals, I think it's always better to have a human cell because you know, the, we've cured mice of lots of neurological diseases over the past 10 years, and almost none of those therapies are translated to human. So I think we need something new, and I think this, we have this opportunity now because of the developments in genetics and stem cells. I think we're going to have a chance over the next decade to really see how well this is going to work. Anything else? Huh? So, I, uh, about a year and a half ago, I was in China, and <laughs> I was taken to an institute where mm -hmm. uh, patients were being recruited from all over the world with ALS and all mm -hmm. kinds of other uh, diseases, mm -hmm. even MS. And they were being treated with stem cells. Mm -hmm. uh, wasn't very well controlled. It yeah. wasn't very clear as to what was going on, mm -hmm. although there was a lot of exuberance being expressed. What's your view about that? Well, I was in, um, I mean, when I was a resident, which was again 20 years ago, I, was, I saw patients, there was a Parkinson's thing, and the, the idea was we'll put stem cells in, you, you know, and they, I saw many of those patients, and the problem was, was that they, they differentiated the right way, but they were uncontrolled. They were making too much dopamine, so the patients had a much worse outcome. They had horrible sort of dopamine toxicity. We had to actually do a deep brain stimulation surgery to make them better. That was the only way, because you know, the thing is we can't control these cells once they're in there. So if they're making something, you know, how do you control how much they make? And I think even when you think about a, a, a one meter nerve, it, you know, all, those, all the migrations and things that occur so carefully during development, all those cues are gone. So if you put them up here, how is it gonna know where to go? So I think, I guess the, my view is that I always view the stem cells, at least for neurological diseases, more as this is our way to try to find a drug that somebody can take to prevent the illness from progressing rather than trying to restore function. Um, res restorative, it just seems, it's just hard for me to imagine how that's going to work as well. Just because of all, again, all the sort of choreography that occurs during brain development, that if we put a stem cell into an aged brain, it, you know, how, where are all the cues that it would normally have? So again, my hope, and again, this is, this is a good one for genetics, is that we want to intervene before the, before the damage occurs. Okay, well, listen, I thank you very, very much, both of you. <laughs>